Well, thank you to everyone for tuning in for our program tonight. For those of you who haven't had a chance to meet me yet, my name is Amelia Wald. I'm the executive director of the Virginia Club of New York, and we are very, very excited to have Justine Hill Edwards with us, tuning in virtually from Charlottesville. So I'm just going to run over a few technical things, and then we'll dive right into Pro Professor Hill Edwards' lecture. As you can see, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And if you have questions that come up throughout the course of her lecture, feel free to go ahead, go ahead and type those questions into the box. There's also a function where you can upvote for questions. So as an audience member, whether you want to write a question in or not, you can vote on other people's questions to cue to us as the moderators what questions you would like to be asked. Something that I love as well as if when folks put their question in the box, if you also include where you're calling in from, our club is based in New York City, but we've been very fortunate in the virtual landscape that folks will tune in from all over. So if you would love to include that, we would love to share it. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and give a brief introduction of Professor Justine Hill Edwards. So she is naturally a faculty member at the University of Virginia, our beloved alma mater. And she um, earned her doctorate in history from Princeton in 2015. And we are so excited because tonight's lecture is going to cover her forthcoming book, which is Unfree Markets, The Slaves Economy and the Rise of Capitalism in South Carolina, which you can look for in April of 2021 from Columbia University Press. So. Professor Hill Edwards, if you would like to go ahead and pull up your slides, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Amelia, for the introduction. Um, first, I want to again thank Amelia and thank the, uh, the staff of the UVA Club of New York and the UVA Office of Engagement for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, this topic, slavery and capitalism, is really one of my favorites. So I'm excited about exploring this complex, complicated, but interesting and very important topic with everyone over the next hour. Um, I'm going to be talking broadly about this topic of slavery and capitalism and then connecting it to my forthcoming book that, as Amelia said, is due out April of 2021. So the relationship between the history of capitalism and the history of slavery in the US has garnered a lot of attention lately, and not just in academic circles. Um, in the aftermath of the financial crash of 2008 in particular, which really widened the racial wealth gap in the US, more scholars, including sociologists, economists, and in particular historians, have been reintroduced and uh, really reinvigorated by the history History of racial and economic inequality in America. From the prison industrial complex to the mortgage crisis, the history of race and capitalism in this country is, irre is, irre ir uh, <laughs> is, uh, is intertwined. You cannot disentangle the two. And that is to say that the history of how ideas of race evolved in America, um, to understand that one has to understand how the history of capitalism evolved as well. And so to gain a fuller understanding of the relationship between race and capitalism, again, one has to understand the history of slavery. And so that is what I'm going to be talking about this evening. And I look forward to your questions. Um, so my talk today is going to be broken up into two parts. The first part, um, I will discuss the economic and really the political history of slavery's expansion beginning in the years after the American Revolution. And then in the second part, I'll talk about how slavery's geographical and economic expansion affected the lives and really the experiences of enslaved men and women themselves. And the second part of my talk will really connect to the work that I am doing in my forthcoming book. So um, let's start with the history of uh, the Constitution and the ways in which the Constitution really protected um, so many of the property rights of slaveholders and thereby protected the institution of slavery. And so make no mistake, slavery was at the center of debates about how to transition from the Articles of Confederation created in 1777 and ratified in 1787 
81, to, uh, to a United States that occurred with the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787. So 55 delegates from the various uh, autonomous states attended the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, at first with the goals of revising the Articles of Confederation, but ultimately with the goal of drafting the document that would bind the states together. And so according to historian David Wallstreicher, the delegates went back and forth about a variety of issues from taxation and representation in Congress to how to negotiate treaties with foreign nations in the electoral process, a topic that is of particular interest to us now since we are just mere weeks out from presidential election. But by far, the most important and most controversial topic that the delegates discussed was the issue of and the future of slavery in the new nation. And the debates over the Constitution, which outlined the structure of the federal government, the structure of Congress and the executive branch and, and the judiciary, revolved in many ways around how slavery would look in the new republic. Ultimately, the delegates made very serious compromises on the issue of slavery, compromises that are apparent in the final 18, uh, 1787 version of the Constitution and compromises that would continue to erupt in, uh, in the uh, landscape of American politics really until the Civil War. And so though six of the Constitution's 84 clauses are directly concerned with slavery. I'm going to focus right now on one, and that is Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the 1787 Constitution. This, no person held in service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law regulation be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered upon um, claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. This is known uh, among historians, among scholars as the fugitive slave clause. And what this clause did was that it required that runaway slaves be returned to their enslavers. And so in this 17, 87 constitution, this clause in particular essentially protected the property rights of slaveholders. It protected enslavers' property rights. And so it is within this federal framework that slavery uh, can continue to be part and parcel, if not foundational in many ways, to ideas of property and really ideas of commerce in the new nation. Um, it solidified enslaved people as property and, uh, and these property rights in human beings were protected by the federal government. Um, and again, it reinforced the property rights of slaveholders. It was not until the 13th Amendment in 1865 that this part of the Constitution was essentially rendered uh, unimportant in understanding uh, the rights of citizens. So we have this clause of the Constitution. I'll talk about another clause in a few minutes. But again, there are six clauses in this original Constitution that have to do with slavery. But for our purposes today or this evening, this clause, um, I think, is the most impactful. And so with the protection of slaveholders' property rights and protected by the federal government um, established at the end of the 18th century, the groundwork was laid by the framers of the Constitution for the expansion and the protection of slavery. And two events in the political history of the early national period really solidified this. Um, more specifically, these two events link, uh, excuse me, Jefferson's purchase of the Louisiana Territory and participation in the Atlantic slave trade made illegal um, are two of these moments um, that catapulted slavery into being such an, an important aspect of the American economy in the 19th century. And so these two events, again, marked a dramatic transition for the American economy and really for the lives of millions of enslaved men and women in the US. Um, and this transition revolved around one product in particular, and that product was cotton, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. 
So the Louisiana Purchase was essentially a land deal brokered between the United States and France. And in it, the U.S. acquired approximately 827,000 square miles of land west of the Mississippi River for $15 million. And here's a little background. Um, we are going to talk about the diplomatic relationships between the U.S. and France. Uh, Napoleon's uh, plans to reassert French dominance in the New World were essentially not going well at the end of the 18th century. And that had to do with a tiny island colony in the Caribbean that uh, in the 1760s and 1770s was producing um, a substantial portion of the world's sugar. And that island colony was Saint-Domingue, modern day Haiti. And so the French army was dwindling because of yellow fever in Saint-Domingue and they were on essentially on the precipice of war with Britain. And so an advisor of Napoleon counseled him to let go of the French territory west of the Mississippi um, to ensure that they would have the funds and the capital to continue fighting in Saint-Domingue and to kind of shore up their military reserves. Uh, Napoleon agreed. And on April 11th, uh, the French foreign minister told an advisor of then President Thomas Jefferson that France was willing to sell all of the Louisiana territory. So again, in that deal uh, negotiated between Napoleon and Jefferson, the U.S. acquired approximately 827,000 square miles of land for $15 million, essentially doubling the size of the U.S. in one land deal. Um, the important part of this for our purposes in terms of slavery and capitalism is that this was land used by the federal government, by slave traders, by enslavers, and by land speculators to cultivate what was the most important product uh, cultivated and exported in America during the 19th century, and that export would be slave produced cotton. And so the cotton gin um, really was revolutionary in uh, transforming the American cotton economy. And so if we think of this relationship between the Louisiana Purchase and the cotton gin, we get this boom in, uh, in the American cotton industry. So the cotton gin was patented by Eli Whitney in 1794. Uh, and the gin again transformed cotton cultivation. It made uh, harvesting cotton and transforming cotton from a bulb to a sellable product, more streamlined. And this, along with the opening of Southern and, and Western lands in North America, spurred a, a feverish scramble for both land and slaves by investors, by capitalists, by enslavers who sought to profit off of the increasing global demand for cotton cultivated in the American South. And so, we see uh, there's this dramatic increase in the uh, exportation of cotton. And so in 1790, enslaved men and women in the US produced about 1.5 million pounds of, of cotton. 10 years later in 1800, they produced 35 million pounds of cotton. By 1830, that number had grown to 331 million pounds of cotton. And by 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, slave cultivated cotton had grown grown in terms of exports to 2.275 billion pounds. And so we are talking about the US being one of the largest exporter of cotton in the world. Um, and so uh, to get again a greater sense of how uh, of how much cotton was being produced, um, we're talking about exponential growth, right? Um, and so all of this is to say that cotton production increased exponentially. And as you can see from the chart, we go from 3,135 bales of cotton in 1790, and one bale is, is 500 pounds, um, to 10 years later, over 73,000 bales of cotton. And again, in 1860, um, we see this number just dramatically increase to um, 3.8 million bales of cotton. And the majority of this is cotton cultivated by enslaved men and women in the slave South. And um, interestingly enough, we, we have again, 3.8 billion, a million pounds in 
1860. And then one year later, at the outbreak of the Civil War, we have 4.48 million pounds and so a million bales. And so we are talking about um, a large number of uh, slave produced cotton. Um, and so to put a finer point on this, more than half of the exports in the US in the first six decades of the 19th century, and so from 1800 to 1860, consisted of this raw cotton, almost all of it grown by enslaved men and women. Make sure I am good on time, okay. Um, and so the, the value of these exports is even more telling. And so in 1800, the approximate value of cotton exports was $5 million. Then if we jump down to 1860, it rose to $192 million. And so if we take a moment to think about this, um, if we take a moment to think about $5 million in 1800 to $192 million in 1860, that is an increase of 3,740%. It is a massive increase. And so if you then direct your attention to the graft on to the graph on the left, um, cotton exports, again, made up of substantial part of American exports, especially in the antebellum period, and so 1820 to 1860. So by 1860, cotton, again, comprised 60% of the American export economy, the majority of that cultivated and produced by enslaved laborers. And so if we know then that the cultivation of cotton increased dramatically in the United States between 1790 and 1860, and we also know that the exportation of slave produced U.S. cotton formed an important part of the American export economy in the first half of the 19th century, then we can also argue then that enslaved people formed an important part of the massive expansion of the American economy in the first six decades of the 19th century. Um, and so let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to talking about uh, the, the Constitution. And if you remember the third slide that I, I showed about the two important moments, the first being the Louisiana Purchase negotiated by Thomas Jefferson, the second being the closing of American participation in the foreign slave trade. This is where the Constitution comes back into our conversation. Um, this is Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 1 of the 1787 Constitution. And it says the migration or importation of such Pers persons shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808. And so this clause in particular relates to the slave trade. And it essentially prevented Congress from banning American participation in the foreign slave trade before 1808. And so what that means is that um, there were conversations about whether the U.S. should continue to import foreign slaves into the U.S., but due to the um, rebellion in Saint-Domingue that spread real fear among enslavers, especially in the slaveholding South, combined with, um, with a small-scale slave revolt in the U.S. In 1800, the Gabriel Prosser re revolt in Virginia for example, really created this fear of importing new slaves into the US. And so, um, and so what occurred was in 1808, um, Congress agreed and, and ratified this ban to, uh, to close American participation, legal American participation in the foreign slave trade. Um, but interestingly enough, in the few years before the ban, um, took place, um, enslavers, enslaved traders, and speculators sought to bring as many enslaved people into the country as possible, especially as the American cotton economy began to expand and grow. And so, for example, between 1804 and 1808, almost 40,000 enslaved Africans were imported into Charleston, South Carolina, alone, which was one tenth, so 10% 10 of the total number of slaves brought into British North America over the previous uh, 200 years. And so it was arg arguably the biggest surge in the uh, global slave trade, especially in the US. 
So in 1808, with legal access to the foreign slave trade closed, um, enterprising planters, enslavers, and slave traders began to look domestically for enslaved people to labor on emerging cotton plantations in the expanding southern slaveholding states. And increasingly, enslaved people were experiencing kind of more fear and terror about being sold down south. This is where that term comes from. The fear of being sold from states in the upper south, states such as Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, to states in the lower south, such as Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. And this is really the beginning of what historians call, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a few minutes, the internal slave trade, the domestic slave trade, or even the second middle passage. And so slaveholders, interestingly enough, such as Thomas Jefferson, believed at this time, believed at the beginning of the 19th century, that slavery would die a slow death through the idea of what he called diff uh, diffusion. Them. The idea that as the, the country expanded, as uh, slaves were being sold down to cotton plantations in the South, that, um, that slavery would become diffuse and the power of enslavers and slave holding states would not be concentrated in Virginia, in states like Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Maryland, and Delaware. Well, that did not happen. Instead, enslavers in states such as Virginia found a ready market for slaves in newly created cotton plantations for the South and West. Again, territory created by the Louisiana Purchase. And it was enslaved people who continued to create to uh, to complete the backbreaking labor of cotton cultivation that again propelled the American economy really into global prominence through cotton. And because of efficiencies again made in cotton cultivation in the 1790s with the cotton gin, combined with the rapid expansion and development of Western lands, precipitated experiences of enslaved people became in many ways more violent, more unpredictable, and really more harsh. Um, their experiences uh, were categorized uh, by more violence, and in particular, enslavers attempting to exert more control over their lives. All of this was in an effort to extract as much labor as possible from enslaved people as possible gains to be made from cotton cultivation began to increase. And so as you see in this map between 1820 and 1860, cotton cultivation spread rapidly throughout the, the South and enslaved men and women labored increasingly on profitable or semi-profitable cotton plantations throughout the Southern US. Um, this occurred too with, um, in tandem with what, again, historians call the second middle passage, this movement or the domestic slave trade, this movement of enslaved men and women further south to cotton growing states such as Mississippi and Louisiana. And so the second middle passage or the domestic slave trade uh, really signified the forced migration of enslaved people. And this map on the right is great because it shows these uh, trade routes. Um, outside of New Orleans, Richmond, Virginia was one of the largest slave trading depots in the nation because of its location with in enslavers in Virginia and North Carolina looking to sell their slaves to enslavers and slave traders further south. Um, estimates are that between 1820 and 1860, at least 875,000 American slaves were forcibly sold from regions of the upper south, and so Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, to regions of the lower south. And this influenced the uh, price of enslaved men and women. The Second Middle Passage combined with the closing of the foreign slave trade. Um, and, and so uh, the rate for prime male hand in New Orleans in 1800 was, was around $500. By the end of the Civil War, and so by 1864, 1860, uh, by the eve of the Civil War, excuse me, 
it had risen to more than $1,800 for one enslaved person. And so um, the forced migration of enslaved people was one component of policies, again, supported by the federal government um, to create an environment that was ripe for capitalist investment and development. And slavery was part and partial of that. Another part of that um, is in Indian removal, a policy supported by President Andrew Jackson to remove uh, Native Americans from the Southeast to lands west of the, the Mississippi, clearing that land of Native American nations and tribes for the development, for the cultivation, for the speculation of cotton. All right, and so, um, and so this is an, an important part of this conversation about slavery and capitalism. I'll talk about racial capitalism in a few moments, but um, the federal government supported this expansion um, and they did so in a variety of ways. Federally funded riverways were created for the transport of slaves, cotton and plantation materials. Um, federally supported uh, institutions, um, financial institutions, for example, banks extended credit to borrowers interested in purchasing land and slaves. And again, the government uh, supported the elimination of Native American uh, from Native American nations from lands that they wanted to use for cotton cultivation for the global marketplace. And so, um, and so these federally created policies, one, with, one might assume is an important part of our understandings of how capitalism evolved in this uh, period. Uh, economic activity and growth supported by the federal government and slavery was part and parcel of that. And so enslavers in the 19th century uh, sought to use all the tools at their disposal to profit from slavery. Um, and again, these activities were supported by the federal government. They used enslaved people as capital, movable capital is what slaveholders, slave traders and investors understood enslaved men and women to be. And they invested heavily in the technologies of slavery. Uh, slave holding capitalists, especially in the 19th century, sold bonds to fund banks they receive loans, using their slaves and land as collateral in the process. These bonds were secured by individual states that chartered these financial institutions, these banks. Entire industries emerged in relationship to slavery and the labor of slaves, from finance to insurance. And what you, you see here is an ad for uh, insurance for slaves. Um, and so entire industries e emerged with slaveholders essentially purchasing insurance policies to protect their, inv their investments in slavery and in enslaved people. Uh, the marketplace for slave insurance in particular in the 1840s and 50s was red hot. Um, from the Nautilus Mutual Life Company, now known as New Insurance, to Lloyd's of London, and Etna, um, the insuring of enslaved people was a visible aspect of American financial services in the 19th century with enslaved people's lives and bodies holding vast amounts of capital. Again, enslaved men and women's bodies were considered to be um, movable capital. Enslaved women's bodies in particular were thought to um, hold capital. They were producers of the next generation of capital investments for their enslavers. And so um, enslavers and slave traders greed for slaves to work on Southern cotton plantations was so strong that in the 1830s and 40s, slave, slave traders sometimes resorted to kidnapping free people of color to fulfill the labor demands of Southern planters. Um, slave stealing became a major business involving networks in the North where you, even free people of color again were kidnapped and sold to slaveholders in the South. The most famous case um, of this was Solomon Northup, the subject of the uh, 
Oscar winning uh, movie. And Northup, um, again, was the most famous case because he, once he uh, was returned to his life as a free man of color, he published his narrative in order to bring attention to this practice. Um, he was taken in March 8, 1841 in Washington, DC, sold in New Orleans, um, where he uh, labored on a, a plantation, a cotton plantation for uh, 12 years. He was uh, freed, emancipated in 1853, and he talks about uh, 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 his experience. This is actually how his narrative begins. He says, having been born a freeman for more than 30 years, um, he was sold into slavery where he remained until happily rescued in the month of January 1853. I have not failed to perceive the increasing interest regarding uh, in the north throughout the northern states in regard to the subject of slavery. And so, um, and so this, this question of the kind of greed for enslaved laborers reflects Solomon Northup's very traumatic experience of, um, of being kidnapped and sold e illegally into slavery. But what it meant was that um, free men and women of color did not have legal protections for their freedom. Um, and what it meant was that slavery continued to influence their lives and their, their abilities to feel fully part of the, the American nation because they feared for their, their own uh, freedom, essentially. And so this leads uh, me to uh, transition more into research that I'm that I conducted for my forthcoming book, um, and that is the relationship between American capitalism and um, in the economic activities of enslaved people. And so um, just a brief uh, definition of capitalism here within the literature on slavery and capitalism, especially in the past uh, seven or eight years, definitions have become uh, both generative, but also very contentious. And so if we understand that cotton was the main commodity produced for a global marketplace of consumers, if we understand that enslavers and cotton planters owned and controlled the means of production, which is enslaved laborers, if we understand that enslaved laborers were used by capitalists to produce this main commodity for a global marketplace, um, and rarely did enslaved pe people own their own commodities legally, right? Because enslaved men and women were not citizens and did not have the same um, legal claims. Um, and enslavers sought to use their, um, their protected status to purchase more land and more slaves. Then, um, then these connections do su suggest that slavery, especially in the 19th century, was part and parcel of the growth and expansion of American capitalism. Um, but as I mentioned just a minute ago, historians debate this quite a bit. Um, most recently, the New York Times' 1619 project has generated a lot of debate, not just among historians, but among Americans writ large about the role of slavery in this really important part of American history and this fundamentally important aspect of American life and culture, and that is capitalism. Um, but all of this is to say that the profits that enslavers sought to gain from slavery, from their investments in the global economy and from the labor of their slaves um, meant that um, in order to look at capitalism and its evolution, it is important then to kind of study its, uh, its foundations. And this is where um, the idea of racial capitalism come, comes in. Um, and this relationship, again, be, between the growth of slavery in the US and the development of capitalism is an important one that scholar, Cedric Robinson interrogates in his book, um, his, his very underrated, I think, underread book, Black Marxism, The Making of the Black Radical Tradition. And this is what he says. 
As a material force then, it, would, it could be expected that racialism would inevitably permeate the social structures emergent from capitalism. I've used the term racial capitalism to refer to this development into the subsequent structure as a historical agency. And so what does this mean? And so according to Robinson, ideas of race, of racial hierarchies, and of racial difference essentially emerged around the same time as ideas of capitalism in Western societies and cultures. He contends in Black Marxism that the working and subjugated classes in Europe were essentially racialized classes, the Irish, for example. And these groups of people were subjected to violence and brutality because those within the society with power, with influence, and with land exploited them. Um, and so our so-called modern ideas about capitalism actually emerged out of this contentious violent relationship. And so the way that capitalism evolved in the British American colonies in the 17th and 18th centuries, then with, with real vigor in the 19th century in the US, evolved in tandem with ideas of not just race, but the realities of slavery. And so for this reason, according to Robinson, ideas of racism are deeply intertwined with ideas of capitalism. And capitalism is therefore not exactly the great equalizing force in American society. And that is because it evolved and developed in the US, not in opposition to slavery, but in tandem with it. And so um, if capitalism evolved in the US out of systems of exploitation that not only involved enslaved people, but also involved poor whites as well as historian Carrie Lee Merritt has interrogated in her recent book, Masterless Men, um, then we have to un understand the use of violence to compel slave productivity, to compel slaves to be productive. Um, and so this, th and so this is where ideas of violence comes in, um, and violence was important, even crucial, one might say, to making slavery a capitalist enterprise or a component of capitalism in the 19th century. Enslavers, in particular uh, regarding the cotton economy, expected enslaved people to continue to harvest increasing amounts of cotton, especially between 1800 and 1850. Um, oh, Overseers and enslavers used, of course, physical violence and intimidation to compel enslaved people into higher levels of productivity. And the picture on the um, on the right is a picture of what was called a slave whipping machine. Um, it is depicted in the slave narrative of runaway slave Moses Roper. And this machine was both used for packing and pressing cotton, and it was used to punish an enslaved person who an enslaver or an Overseer thought um, needed this violent punishment. And so enslavers, of course, used violence to compel productivity among enslaved men and women, but they had a real toolbox of coercive techniques and tools um, to compel enslaved people again towards higher levels of productivity and in an attempt to convince them to not run away. Violence, of course, was one tool as we see here, but the lore of capitalism and the capitalist economy was another. And this is where my own research comes into play. And so um, part of uh, enslavers strategy to compel enslaved people to be more productive was to kind of lure them with the, the promise of making money and using their money to buy goods, to act as consumers. Um, and this is what uh, is called in part the slaves economy. And so enslaved people from the low country of South Carolina to the markets of New Orleans actually achieved a degree of economic independence. Um, they produce their own food, they tended their own cash crops, they raised livestock, made furnished goods, they marketed their goods in public marketplaces, they engaged in a whole host of economic activities. And these activities are what historians like myself call the slaves economy. Um, interestingly enough, enslaved men and women could even, in certain instances, bequeath property to their descendants. But 
uh, all of this economic activity that in many ways shaped the, the lives of enslaved men and women um, did not mean that they could uh, kind of transform um, this economic activity into uh, freedom which is ultimately what they, they wanted. In, interestingly enough though, the idea of the, the slaves economy is not, um, is not, not new. Right is not just a vestige of um, of slavery in the U.S. or in the Atlantic world writ large. Enslaved men and women in slaveholding societies throughout history actually um, used their labor uh, to supplement their income in 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 many ways, using I ideas constructed around the idea of the uh, of, of what was called a peculium. Um, and so it is not su surprising there therefore, that enslaved men and women could engage in these types of activities, because by and large, what it meant was that they could trade, they could buy goods such as sugar and coffee and shoes and clothing. But what few enslaved men and women could do was purchase their freedom. And that is why the slaves economy was so important to enslavers. Um, and in many ways, um, so frustrating for enslaved people. Um, slave economies essentially became a part of enslavers capitalist project. They did not see it as threatening their investments in slavery, nor did they see it as threatening their mastery over enslaved people. Um, slaveholders increasingly began to control enslaved men and women's economic activities because they saw the profits that enslaved people could make from, from these activities, right? And so instead of uh, in, enslavers providing food or buying food for enslaved people, the enslaver would tell the enslaved man, man or woman that they could grow their own food and would not have to re rely on the enslaver's food. What this meant is that enslaved men and women had to spend even more time working and laboring, tending their own garden plots and livestock just to maintain themselves, just to survive. But what this did, especially in the antebellum period, is that this move actually increased enslavers' profits. And so if we understand then the, the slaves' economy not undermining the institution of slavery, but in many ways reinforcing it, it forced me to think about the ways in which um, perhaps capitalism is not this kind of liberating force that, um, that is talked about in American culture and so society. If we think about the confluence of race and capitalism, especially in the context of slavery, and we look at the role of capitalist enterprise in enslaved people's lives, then it is not this kind of raw positive force. Um, but all of that, that is to say that there are great examples of in, enslaved people engaging in these types of economic activities. Um, this is a quote from the South Carolina uh, Gazette from September 1772. And in a place like uh, South Carolina and Charleston in particular, the public displays of, of kind of economic act activity were by and large done by in enslaved women. And so this, this quote is great. It says, I have seen these Negro women surround fruit carts in every street and purchase amongst them the whole contents to the exclusion of every white person. And they are your slaves who fix the exorbitant prices where we're scarce any but black butchers are employed. And so I can just imagine um, in enslaved women kind of dominating the, the, the marketplace for their goods perhaps, because this was the one uh, space where they could control their own lives and their own destinies. All right, so I'm gonna to speed through through these. These are, are kind of examples of in, enslavers talking about their perspective on the, the slaves economy there. There were enslavers um, who supported it and in, enslavers such, such as the one on the, the left who, who didn't. There were interestingly enough, slaveholders who, um, who were beginning 
going to use business practices that they have to their other businesses in their interactions with enslaved men and women. This is an account from um, Charles C. Pinckney from South Carolina. He is the nephew and namesake of um, South Carolina's delegate to the Constitutional Convention, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. And he wrote a letter uh, essentially saying that not only does he allow his slaves to trade, not only did he trade with his slaves, but he began keeping an accounting of his trade with slaves in many ways kind of formalizing what and up until that point had been considered uh, kind of a black market, right? That had been considered informal. He begins to formalize his trade with slaves. And this was not just um, what Pinckney was, was doing. Enslavers all across the South actually began to account for their, their trade with slaves um, in a way that they would weigh cotton or figure out how much um, money they were, were getting for one or two bales of, of, of cotton. And so the kind of practices that we associate with capitalism, enslavers were applying to their trade with slaves. And so uh, in conclusion, um, there is in my mind at least a very clear connection between capitalism and slavery in the US. Um, slavery de developed into a capitalist enterprise, especially in the 19th century. And there are kind of really important markers along the way, starting with the Constitutional Convention of 17. 87. And again, it is important to, to note that, um, that enslaved men and women contributed economically to this period of massive economic growth, um, such that uh, the value of the almost 4 million enslaved men and women in the US amounted to approximately $3.5 billion. And enslaved people essentially on the eve of the war was the biggest financial asset in the US. And so in many ways, again, the, the Civil War was this major rupture, um, not just for the American economy, but for the millions of African Americans who could finally own themselves, own their bodies, and own their labor. Um, and so ultimately, um, slavery was an exploitative institution, but was part and parcel of the growth of the American economy, especially in the 19th century. And in order to understand the origins of American slavery, we must understand its connections to race and to um, capitalism. So thank you very much. Thank you, Justine. That was fascinating. It makes me very excited for your forthcoming book, certainly. So I very much appreciate that. And we have a ton of wonderful questions, both in the Q&A box and that were submitted in advance. So I will go ahead and start hitting on a couple of those. One of the questions that got um, some votes is from Ainsley. And she asked, um, you spoke a little bit earlier about masterless men and, and other researchers. And Ainsley is wondering, how did non-enslavers in free states still benefit from the slave economy? both on an individual level and then particular industries that might not have been directly tied to slavery, but were indirectly tied to the industry. Okay, so I do have another question. When you talk about the slaves, are you talking about the economic activities of slaves or are you talking about the entire economy of slave-based um, products and labor? Well, I think that is a great question. That was actually <laughs> something that I wondered as well as I read through um, read through some of these questions and was listening to your discussion. I think there is an interesting definition conversation, a pedagogical mm -hmm. conversation about slave economy versus slaves economy. So perhaps sure. you want to touch on that first and then maybe sure. discuss um, the other question. So the the e economy of slavery, which is what I'll, I'll call it, is um, it's considered to be the entire economic ac activity, the the labor of enslaved people that went to producing cash crops like cotton. Um, what I talk about in my fourth forthcoming book is the slaves possessive economy, and what that is is the individual independent economic activities of enslaved men and women. And so what they did to participate as independent actors in their kind of local communities. Um, but interestingly enough, um, 
if we're talking about the slaves economy, I, I can see many ways in which um, this type of economic activities of, of slaves contributed to kind of this broader e economy. What it meant is that enslavers were investing less and less in maintaining slaves and more and more in purchasing more slaves and purchasing more land and purchasing more machinery. And so indirectly, um, the slaves economy made the economy of slavery uh, more productive. And I think that, that that is an important part of this conversation, um, such that more and more cotton was being exported, more and more um, kind of credit was being extended to, uh, to enslavers to again, begin this cycle and process again of purchasing more slaves, land and machinery. Thank you. And do you mind touching a little bit about how perhaps industries that were not um, directly slave owning still benefited from the like econo economic activity of slaves, both as individual persons and then also the mm -hmm. economy of slavery? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I can say that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I need a bit more specificity. Um, we can talk about uh, you know, industries, especially in these southern states or states where slavery was still legal, um, renting slaves, there was an, an increasingly profitable um, economy of slave hiring that occurred in states such as Maryland, but all the way to Louisiana, where um, non slave holding whites would rent a slave for a specific period of time, be it two days, six months, one year. And this practice was uh, potentially profitable for enslaved people because they could sometimes negotiate the price of their hire. But what it meant was that enslaved people, men in particular who were hired out, were kind of subject to the whims of some, someone who really didn't own him. Um, and so in many ways, uh, uh, slavery and the labor of in, enslaved men and women was used in a variety of in industries, especially in the slave holding South, um, such that states would sometimes rent slaves to work on uh, public projects, building roads and canals and clearing riverways. Um, and so in many ways, slave labor can, uh, contributed not to just cotton cultivation, but entire industries writ large. Thank you very much for expounding upon that. Sure. Robert has a question about the earlier part of your presentation about the Louisiana Purchase, and he wonders if cotton was being farmed in the Louisiana, Louisiana Territory prior to its purchase, or if the U.S. brought cotton into that region. There were small amounts of, of cotton cultivated in the Louisiana uh, territory, but the uh, variety of cotton and the, um, the, the technology of cotton cultivation really started by the, the cotton gin was really a 19th century phenomenon. Um, interestingly enough, though, uh, cotton had been cultivated in states such as uh, South Carolina and Georgia from the 1720s. And we're talking about like a very silky, long staple cotton is what it's called. Um, short staple cotton had been cult uh, cultivated in regions in the uh, Southeast for generations, for centuries really, but it was really, really difficult to cultivate, mostly be, uh, because inside a cotton bulb, bulb there are seeds, and it was very difficult to remove the, the seeds from the, the bulb. And what the gin did was, uh, was kind of speed up this, this process and made it much, much more efficient. Thank you. So I'm going to touch on some of the questions that came in beforehand. Sure. Um, so before folks had the context of your presentation based more on the, the description of the lecture, a yeah. lot of folks are wondering about the modern day application of your research. And some folks are wondering about how businesses can support social justice movements today and how they can empower their local communities. If you're comfortable speaking on a more modern sure. number of bit. Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, well, one of the extensions of my research is to really think through and complicate our uh, belief that um, investments in uh, businesses will be a saving grace, because I don't think that that is the, the case. I think that if we are really going to get to the heart of 
issues of the racial wealth gap, of systemic and institutional racism, that we are talking about uh, policy conversations, we are talking about the federal government intervening in ways that it had not in previous generations. Um, and so this is kind of larger than what one can do in one's community. At the same time, though, I think that there is a lot of work to, to be done in terms of recognizing one's own privilege. I know that that, that that term has been used a lot, and I think rightfully so, in thinking about the ways in which this history continues to inform how we think about systemic and institutional racism and discrimination. And so I, I hope that that uh, is a launching off point for kind of broader conversations about um, about how we as citizens not just treat one another, but hold the federal government accountable for making and imposing policy solutions to these institutional and systemic problems. Well, thank you for being willing to span the centuries with that, because I know um, that's a challenge for historians when they're thrown into the thick of modern day conversation. I don't study this. I don't talk about <laughs> policy. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I, I think it speaks to the interdisciplinary nature of your research. And like you said, the, the implications that it has um, for us, let's see, there was another question in the chat that really jumped out to some folks. Um, so Joshua is wondering if perhaps you could speak to um, in the in the days of the Civil War as the Lincoln administration is pushing for an emancipation policy about the economic implications for that and how the economy factored into emancipation um, as opposed to perhaps solely for moral reasons. Ooh. Oh, oh. Um. Well, I think that I am actually not sure that there were too many economic imperatives in the Lincoln ad administration um, proposing emancipation. Um, and let's not forget that um, the Emancipation Pro Proclamation only uh, emancipated enslaved men and women in rebellious states. There were border states, Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, that still held slaves where slavery was still legal. And so, um, but I, but, and this, this is not, this was not uncommon. The Lincoln administration used the Emancipation Proclamation as by and large a military strategy more than an, an, an economic one. Because on the, the ground, what had to happen was that enslaved men and women had to stop working and leave and they did in, in droves. And so, and so far as the Emancipation Proclamation um, uh, made really, Im, important uh, political strides and military strides in the, the war it was incumbent upon enslaved people to leave, right? And they did by the thousands. Um, but uh, I was gonna say something else. To, I think there, there was a second part to the question, Amelia. Um, I guess the question was asking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, since the narrative is that this was a moral decision about how yeah. economics might have might have affected. Mm -hmm. But I think you spoke as well to the fact that it was a military strategy. And so sure. oh, yes. beyond the morality. Yes, I was going to say, and, and, and that strategy of using slave emancipation as a military and political tool was not new in the Civil War. Um, in the American Revolution, <laughs> that was used um, uh, quite controversially. Uh, to buy both the uh, by both patriot and loyalist forces to sway the momentum of the the war. Slaves were essentially used as military pawns, and so um, and so it was not a new strategy. Wonderful. Well, it looks like we have time for about two more questions. Um, and for those questions that we don't get to, we can always send them to Professor Hill Edwards and she um, can certainly mull them over and perhaps uh, answer them if she ever finds free time sometime between teaching and publishing. Uh, but one question from Alicia asks if you could speak a little bit more and expound upon um, the connection between slavery and insurance companies and if this was prevalent in other industries as well. Alicia points in particular, she gives mining as an example of Ooh. capitalism and insurance. Mm -hmm. Well, this this is such a fascinating topic. And there is a historian who, who um, has, has written a book on, on this. She's from Providence College. Sharon Ann Murphy um, 
it's funny, I was just talking about this, this book to students in my slavery capitalism class. Um, investing in, in life, and it is about the insurance industry in antebellum America. And so interestingly enough, um, there were insurance companies that insured enslaved people's lives. Um, and in enslavers, uh, we're taking out insurance policies to protect their investments. And actually, one of the biggest uh, kind of cases in, in terms of slave insurance was not in the US. It was uh, a slave ship all the long. And um, when the um, slave ship captains realized that they did not have enough food for the slaves from the on the journey, I think it was somewhere, it was an illegal ship, I think, or it was a ship to somewhere in the, the Caribbean. They ended up throwing the enslaved people into the Atlantic and returning to the UK to, um, to recoup their and their in, investments through an insurance policy and so this this question of kind of in, insuring slave lives is very interesting and um historians are really starting to dig into this as as well more and more over the past few years thank you and there's one question in the chat which i don't know if your research touches on this so we'll, we'll you know we'll throw it to you and see um perhaps but speaking to insurance maxine is actually wondering if you know of insurance companies that sought to recapture escaped enslaved people and if that if those two industries ever collided oh i don't know mm, that that is a great question i'm actually not not sure my hypothesis is that probably yeah i think so mm -hmm. I think, so. I think personally, it's an exciting note to end on um, the questions that are still open ended since um, yeah. there's obviously so much more to research and discover. And so we would love to thank you for joining us tonight, Justine. This has been wonderful. Thanks All this so talk much. of insurance is reminding me that if we had been able to have you up to our home in the Yale Club, I could have pointed to the MetLife building right out the window. But um, instead, you're in Charlottesville and I'm in New York and our audience members are from all over. So I am so grateful that you could join us and that everyone could join us. And for those of you who tuned in a little bit late, or if you have friends who weren't able to attend tonight, there will be a recording of this lecture available soon. And I want to thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. So thank you, Justine, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good night, everyone.